Today's going to be the first presentation on biology. We're not going to get real, real in-depth into DNA and everything. That's going to, we're going to save that for next week. First off, I want to finish ice cores from the end of the geology presentation last week. A lot of people will tell you that ice cores prove that the Earth is millions of years old. And this isn't true. Don't let people tell you that. There's some huge, thick pieces of ice in Greenland. And people drill these long cores way down into them. They bring up this cylinder of ice. These ice cores have layers in them. And they're assumed to be annual layers. So they're assumed to be summer, winter, summer, winter layers. In the summer, the ice melts and it gets a little bit more dense and it forms a different color. And then in the winter, the, the ice is, is less compacted. And so you get these summer, winter, summer, winter layers, supposedly. And these cores are extremely deep. Some of them are up to 10,000 feet deep. And so the, the idea for the evolutionists is, well, how do you get this much ice accumulation? How do you get this many layers if the flood occurred 4,400 years ago? Well, the Lost Squadron is an interesting story that sort of gives us some indication that you can actually get a lot of layers really fast. And uh, the Lost Squadron was actually some P-38s. And so they were flying these over by dead reckoning to Europe. Okay, they didn't have all the navigational technology we have now. They ended up running out of fuel because the place that they were supposed to refuel at was blocked. And so they ended up having to make an emergency landing on some ice. And the first guy actually landed with his landing gear down, and he flipped upside down. The pilot was okay, just minor injuries. And the others learned from that and kept the landing gear up and sort of belly landed in the soft snow. But what they actually did is about 48 years later, they went back, and these things were buried under 263 foot of snow. And no, they didn't sink down in the ice. Okay, that was the first thing I thought was maybe they sunk down in the ice. No, apparently that's not, that's not a legitimate explanation. There had been 263 feet of ice accumulation in 48 years. Okay, and it's actually interesting. It's called cold mining. And they take a really hot metal ball and they just sort of lower it down and then suck out the water. But if you do the math on this, 263 feet in 48 years is 5.5 feet per year, which means that in 10,000 feet, you could get that in 1,824 years. Okay, well, you had a lot more rainfall right after the flood, so you would have gotten ice accumulation a lot faster. So ice cores don't disprove the biblical chronology. There were a lot more than just 48 layers. There were hundreds of layers that had, that had formed on top of it. They had actually done an expedition in 1983 in which they cold mined down, and they went 62 feet down, and they stopped. They left some wood down there. Then later, they found that ice covered in just a few years by 62 feet of ice. But Scientific America and others still refer to the core lines as annual layers, even though you can get multiple layers in a single year. And I debated about whether I, this should still be in there, and my good friend Rich Keller showed me a debate in which this was one of his main lines of reasoning for the Earth being much, much older, like hundreds of thousands or millions of years old, versus the biblical chronology. So it, I don't think it holds much weight. Mainly we're going to talk today about biology. Just going to cut you on biology, sort of ease our way into it. We're going to get into some pretty hardcore stuff next week about DNA and information theory and that type of thing, but we're not going to do that today. Today we're going to talk about evolution, natural selection, speciation, lies in the textbooks, which are the peppered moth, vestigial organs, and recapitulation. It's a big word. Anyway, when Crick and Watson, the first discoverers of DNA in the 1960s, saw DNA with their scanning electron microscope, they looked at DNA and they said, aha, there's no God. Obviously, when we look at DNA, we say the opposite. We say, ah, this is absolutely great, fantastic evidence that there is a God. And so your biases play an important part even in biology. And why did they say there was no God? Well, because they had rejected the concept of God a priori, meaning beforehand. If you tell someone who's already rejected the concept of God beforehand that God loves them and has a wonderful plan for their life, they're not going to even hear you. It's not going to get through to them. You might as well be talking to a brick wall because they don't even believe in God. But we have everyone telling us evolution is a fact. We've got my biology textbook saying evolution is a fact. We've got uh, mainstream scientists saying evolution is true. We have the Vatican saying it's true. We have the president of Baylor saying it's true. So everyone believes that it must be true, right? Well, Hitler, who was a really good brainwasher, said if you say a lie loud enough and long enough and hard enough, people will believe you. This is called argument ad populum, saying that everyone believes it, therefore it must be true. Everyone could be wrong, could they? I mean, the old adage your mother probably told you, if everyone was jumping off a bridge, would you do it? Some things are just against common sense. Okay, the answer is no, yeah, obviously you wouldn't. And a lot of people think the pop stars can sing well. Can they? I don't think so. 
Last week we talked about fossil intermediates. This week we're going to talk about natural selection and speciation. And the next week we're going to talk about mutations, DNA, and that type of thing. The whole high school biology textbook says this, you are an animal and share a common heritage with an earthworm. <sighs> Margaret Sanger said, the most merciful thing a large family can do to one of its, in- its infant members is to kill it. If you've got a large family, just kill one of the, its infant members. You've got redundancy, you don't need it. Okay, well, if you share a common heritage with an earthworm, there's no reason not to just kind of squish it, right? Uh, we do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. Evolution produces these types of ideas, the idea that, that we're, we come from earthworms and that we're really worth no more than the animals. Okay, Hitler said this, let me control the textbooks and I will control the state. The state will take its youth and give to youth its own education, its own upbringing. Your child belongs to us already. What are you? When people say they're eliminating religion from schools, it's not true. They're just replacing it with the religion of humanism. Humanism is as much a religion and as much based on faith. And the people who study it know this. Okay? And I've shown a lot of quotes already from people who are foremost in their field who say, well, I don't have the evidence. Martin Luther, 400 years ago, said this, I'm very much afraid that schools will prove to be the great gates of hell unless they diligently labor in explaining the Holy Scriptures. How much scripture did you learn in school? I don't know, I didn't learn too much. I learned a lot more in church. Engraving them in the hearts of youth, I advise no one to place his child where the Scriptures do not reign paramount. 200 years ago in America, things were very different. The Bible was used as one of the main books for study in the schools, and that's not so anymore. Um, George Washington said it's impossible to rightly govern without God and the Bible. But here we go. Here we have the tree of life shows that we come from a common ancestor. So here we get to the tree of life. All the many forms of life on earth today have descended from a common ancestor found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. Primitive unicellular organisms. That kind of sounds like they're simple organisms, right? Simple unicellular organisms. Are any single-celled animals simple? There's about as much complexity in a single cell as there is in a full-blown city like New York. You've got, you've got all kinds of, you've got the Golgi apparatus, you've got ribosomes, you've got endoplasmic reticulum, you've got you know, a double lipid bilayer, surround, which is the nucleus that surrounds the DNA and protects it. You've got tremendous complexity. You've got proteins that are embedded in that, that, that transport the, the RNA, which is a copy of the DNA, out so that proteins can be made. You've got tremendous complexity going on, organized complexity going on within each cell. There's no simple cell. They're tremendously complicated. Now, here's a typical textbook, Tree of Life. Here they start at a single cell organism, and eventually they get up to man. Look where man is on there, below the shark. I just thought that was funny. Here they are, bacteria, and here's humans. But what they don't tell you is that before the bacteria, there was rocks, and it rained on the rocks for billions of years. So actually, they sh- I think they should have rocks on here that the bacteria came from. I think that, that would be- make this story a little bit more clear. Genesis 126 says how we were really created. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And uh, so here's the typical tree of life from biology textbook. And as we mentioned last week, this is all religious speculation, Okay. We don't have representatives that show how they branch off. Mere religious speculation. Stephen Jay Gould of Harvard says this, The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. Merrill Leakey, one of the most famous anthropologists, said this, All those trees of life with their branches of our ancestors? That's a lot of nonsense. G.A. Kirkut said this, The theory that all the living forms in the world have arisen from a single source, in which itself came from an inorganic form, the evidence of which supports this, is not sufficiently strong to allow us to consider it as anything more than a working hypothesis. And I remember I was sitting in biology class next to Marilee Gardner, and I was asking the professor, my biology, high school biology class, I said, well, if you have thousands of, quote, bad mutations, pass along to the children for every one, quote, good mutation, how do you ever get an accumulation of good mutations? seems like the bad mutations that are passed on outweigh the good ones, which was a legitimate question because we were were talking about that subject, and I tried to relegate my questions to things that were applicable to the lesson he was teaching. And Mary Lee turns to me, and she says, well, isn't evolution true? Hasn't been proven true? 
And I said, oh, no, 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 it's just a theory, which really chapped his hide. But it is true. It's just a, it's a, this calls it a working hypothesis, and I think that that works as well. Okay, inorganic form, a rock. That's what they don't tell you. But I thought evolution was a fact. It seems like everyone calls it a fact. It's brainwashing when books do this. A lot of times people confuse evolution. What evolutionists will do when they're talking with you is they'll get you to believe in natural selection, which is actually biblical, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And they'll say, see, now that you believe in natural selection, you've got to believe in evolution. No, you don't. Natural selection and speciation is not evolution. Okay, British Museum of Natural History. They've got a great uh, brainwashing 101 series that they've put together here. It's called the Origin of the Species Exhibit. They have this on there. It's a direct jab at the creationists. It says, before Charles Darwin, most people believed that God created all living things in exactly the form that we see them today. This is the basis of the doctrine of creation. This isn't true. This is a straw man argument that they're raising here. We don't believe God actually created basset hounds and mastiffs. Okay? That happened after the flood, that we bred them to produce those kinds. They, they actually, the genetic material God programmed at creation to produce those, but they didn't actually exist in that form at creation. And then the next plaque says this, Darwin's work supported the view that all living things have developed into the forms that we see today by a process of gradual change over very long periods of time. This is what is meant by evolution. Okay, fine. So then the next plaque shows dogs. Okay, we have different kinds of dogs. The next plaque shows horses. We've got different colors of horses. We've got different kinds of butterflies. We've got different rabbits, lots of rabbits. We've got ducks. We've got flowers. You see how they look a little bit different there? Okay, and then we get to the weasels. And I don't know what this is trying to show here, but when weasels breed together, they produce more weasels like themselves. Okay, I'm not making this up. This is at the museum. <laughs> that's, that's very scientific. It's been done. I, I can't argue with that. I don't know how it proves evolution, but I can't argue with that. But what we're seeing here is variation within a kind. We're not seeing one kind changing from another. We're not seeing a weasel turning into a dog and a dog turning into a horse. We're seeing variation within a kind that's perfectly biblical. God programmed robustness into his creation for a reason. And so this is not evidence for evolution. This is variation within a kind. What they said at the beginning, if you remember, when they said that we believe that God created everything in exactly the form we see them today, they're actually talking about the top plot there, which is called the creationist lawn. Okay, and that means that God created 250 different kinds of dogs, created hundreds of different kinds of horses, created you know, all the different animals in exactly the form we see them today. What we actually believe is the second plot there, which is the creationist orchard, which is God created the original kinds, and then he said, go and populate the earth. And when they left their geographic regions and they became isolated from each other, and you see this on islands really well, you see some really unusual animals on islands. Well, it's only because they've been isolated from each other and natural selection has killed off some of the traits and you actually end up with animals that are of the same kind that look different than other animals. Okay, but all the genetic material was there at creation. There's no new genetic material being produced, no new information being added to the system. I was there first. And they came on that couch and sat beside me. But anyway, this is variation within a kind. You can get basset hounds, mastiffs, Great Danes, whatever, Bijan, Frichets, and all that from male and a female. Equivocation is what uh, evolutionists try to do, and they're switching the meaning of a single word partway through the argument is what it means. Here, underneath evolution as a fact, it says, why do scientists consider evolution to be a fact? In this section, we look at five compelling lines of evidence, fossils, traces of evolutionary history in existing organisms, continental drift, direct observations of change, and the experimental production of new species. And they say, well, if you believe in any one of these five things, then you've got to believe in evolution. This is called equivocation. People do it with natural selection. Well, if you believe in natural selection, then you believe in evolution. No, that's not the case. Kenneth Miller wrote a book, Finding Darwin's God. He said, there's no doubt that if you jump up into the air, you will end up on the ground below. It makes no difference whether you understand or even believe in gravity. What goes up must come down. Just as definitively, life on Earth has evolved and is continuing to evolve all around us all the time. Why don't you give actual evidence instead of just equivocating it with the law of gravity? <laughs> so the word evolution has many meanings, only one of which is scientific. Okay, cosmic evolution, origin of time, space, matter, a.k.a. the Big Bang. Chemical evolution, origin of elements of hydrogen. Stellar and planetary evolution, origin of stars and planets. Organic evolution, origin of life. 
macroevolution, changing from one kind of animal to another. And then there's microevolution. Okay, this is variation within a kind. The first five are historical. We can't actually do experiments and prove that they actually happened in our past. They deal with events in the past that are unreproducible. And Dr. Sarfati suggests not to use the word microevolution. Technically, it's right. It means variation within a kind. But when you're talking to someone and you say, yeah, I believe in microevolution, variation within kind, then, then they'll come back and say, well, if you add up a bunch of micro things, you actually get a macro, and so you can get kinds changing. Okay? And it takes quite a bit of effort and struggle to explain why that's not the case. I think it's better just to say variation within a kind. That sort of clears up a lot of the problems with using the term microevolution. But technically, it's right. It's, it's a fine term to use, technically. The first five are actually historical science, okay, not empirical science. So variation within kind represents loss of information via preferential selection of genes. This is sort of artificial selection. This really isn't natural selection. But uh, they artificially breed these dogs to produce poodles. And that thing there, I think, the, the bottom one on the right won the ugliest dog competition one of those years. And it's one of those hairless breeds. Poor little guy. It's not his fault. <laughs> the entire creation's been frustrated. So just to kind of explain natural selection, if you have two dogs, one has a gene for long hair and short hair, and the other dog has a gene for long hair and short hair, and they have four puppies, statistically speaking, you get a short hair, short hair dog, which would have short hair. You could have a long hair, short hair dog, which would have medium length hair. You'd have two long-haired, long-haired dogs. What if these two died out? Would, could you ever produce a short-haired dog from these? No, you can't. You've lost genetic material. So when I say natural selection is sorting and loss, this is what we're talking about. When, when animals get isolated from the main group, sometimes genes are lost. The, the animals die, and their genes aren't represented in their children. And that's the opposite of evolution, when you lose information, that you're going in the wrong direction. And if you remember the woolly mammoths, you know, we've lost the ability for elephants to have hair. So that's loss of information. Same type of deal. It's interesting, Gregor Mendel was a monk in Europe. But he was actually doing real science at the same time Darwin was on the Galapagos Islands. And he actually figured out the concept of heredity before genes were ever even thought of. Gregor Mendel was an actual, actual good science. And uh, he, had, he did an experiment with 28,000 pea plants. Okay, I'd like to see his garden. He cross-pollinated the pea plants and did some work with the flowers, found out the concept and the mathematics behind genetics. And one thing he found out was that genetic traits are fixed. You can't get, if you've got pea plants that have only yellow, yellow peas, only produce yellow, yellow peas, you can't get green, green peas. This is important science there. So what evolution requires is change from one kind to another. Okay, that's basically what evolution is, changing from one kind to another. Sometimes it's called particles to people, goo to you, microbes to men. But in order to do that, you've got to have a tremendous increase in genetic information content. And we're going to talk about information theory next week, but you've got to have a tremendous increase in, in information. Evolution goo to you requires change of a kind. So it requires a cow changing into a killer whale, for example. That would be a change of a kind. And that's different from natural selection. It does not equal natural selection, which is in variation within a kind. Okay, you've got the same kind of animal, just different expressions of the genes that God originally created at creation. Princeton zoology professor Peter Grant did an intensive 18-year study of Galapagos finches in the Galapagos Islands, during which natural selection was observed in action. One thing evolutionists will tell you was, well, we've got all these different animals, and it takes hundreds of thousands of years for them to separate out and to become different from each other. Therefore, that, that throws the whole biblical chronology out of the water right there. He's not a Christian, by the way, as far as I know. This is from Dr. Sarfi's Refuting Evolution 2. He said, at the observed rate, Grant estimates it would take only 1,200 years to transform the medium ground finch into the cactus finch, for example. To convert it into the more similar large ground finch would take only some 200 years. All the speciation that we've observed today after the flood can fit into the past 4,400 years. There's no reason for people to say, well, it's, the Earth has to be hundreds of thousands of years old just so you get speciation. And remember, natural selection is a big part of the creation fall model. If God didn't program robustness into the animals and plants, none of us would be here. None of us would have survived after the flood and uh, after any, of, any catastrophes. So he, and especially plants have a tremendous amount of robustness in them. 
So evolution, goo to you, is not speciation either. Carolus Linnaeus, a creation scientist, founder of the science of taxonomy, I remember kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, from sixth grade maybe, maybe not. He was trying to determine what the original created kinds were that God created. What organisms today represent the kinds God created in the beginning? He defined a species as a group of organisms that could interbreed among themselves, but not with another group. Genesis 1, 11 and 12 says, Then God said, Let the earth produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit with seed in it, according to their kinds. And it was so. So we have the trees and the plants always reproducing according to their kind, according to Genesis. The earth brought forth vegetation, seed-bearing plants according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. When the Bible repeats a phrase over and over again, it means it's important. Okay? Things are supposed to reproduce after their own kind. And that's what we see happening. Genesis 1, 20 and 22. Then God said, Let the waters swarm with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the large sea creatures and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water according to their kinds. Every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Genesis 1, 24 and 25. Then God said, let the earth produce living creatures according to their kind, livestock, creatures that crawl, and wildlife on the earth according to their kind. And it was so. God made the wildlife of the earth according to, th- to their kind, the livestock according to their kind, and creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kind. And God saw that it was good. So we have everything reproducing according to its kind. The wolf, to poodle, is just loss of information. Speciation is the loss of information. It's not good to use. Speciation supports the idea of created kinds. It's a way to get the diversity that we see around us without evolution. Okay, artificial speciation is not evolution. Here was one of the famous examples of speciation that we have in which they took some flies. They actually fed starch to one group of flies, and in eight generations, the starch turned light brown. They fed maltose-based food to another set group of flies, and they turned dark brown. And eight generations later of feeding on this, they stuck them in the same cell together, and lo and behold, they don't breed with each other. Okay, they don't look enough alike to breed. Okay, well, they call this, they call this speciation. Okay, I don't think anyone would call this evolution at all. So speciation is not evolution. Don't let someone say, well, because you believe in speciation, you've got to believe in evolution. That's not true. Beyond that, we have Zedonts, Ligers, and Waffens, oh my. So Zedonx, a zebra and a donkey, had a child, and it kind of has stripes, kind of doesn't, kind of looks like a donkey, but not really, just kind of a mix-up. We have Walflins. Kilmaloo was born on May 15, 1985 at Sea Life Park. They had an open water show, and um, they got a false killer whale, and a dolphin shared the same water tank. And they basically, surprise, had a baby together, and it ended up being half false killer whale, half dolphin doesn't really look very much like either one of them. So uh, they're obviously the same kind. We have ligers, leopons, jaglions, tigons, jaglepts, lyajagulepts, lay jaguars, lip jags. These are all combinations of cats, obviously, but most of these are not fertile at all, except there was one tigon one time that was able to have fertile offspring, but it was very sickly. When animals get isolated from each other for long periods of time, something happens to their genetics, and they're not as compatible with each other as they once were at creation. The entire creation's been frustrated, so you get bad things happening, and most of these are not fertile. The liger is kind of interesting. It's about twice as big as a male. It's about 900 pounds. It's an enormous cat, the biggest cat you have is a liger. Buffalo and a cow look pretty different, but uh, they're actually of the same originally created kind, and actually... A buffalo can be breeded with, with every American cow, every cow, and produce fertile offspring. So they're obviously pretty genetically close. So they haven't been separated that long. You get some kind of strange looking ones there with the white on its head. Then we have a pizzly or a griller bear. It's a half polar bear, half grizzly bear. They usually probably, because of geographical differences, don't come into contact with each other this much. But this was actually one they found in the wild that they shot down. And uh, it ended up being sort of a hybrid between them. So God created things according to their kind and told them to reproduce according to their kind. Evolution requires animals to change from one kind of animal into another and therefore cannot be biblical. Number three, animals changing from one kind into another requires new information in the form of DNA. We'll talk about that next week. And natural selection and speciation is not evolution. And a natural selection and speciation produces sorting and loss of information, which is the opposite of evolution. 
Okay, evolution requires new information to be created so that you can get an increase in complexity and a progression upwards. Last thing we're going to talk about is the world's best fairy tales that are in your science textbooks. We're going to talk about peppered mouth, vestigial organs, and recapitulation. Here's the peppered moth. International Wildlife Encyclopedia says this. This is the most striking evolutionary change ever to have been witnessed by man. And Isaac Asimov, vice president of MENSA, the genius club or organization, said this. One of the arguments of the creationists is that no one has ever seen the forces of evolution at work. That would seem the most near irrefutable of their arguments, and yet, too, it is wrong. In fact, if any confirmation of Darwinism were needed, it has turned up in examples of natural selection that have taken place before our eyes. A notable example occurred in Darwin's native land, in England. It seemed the peppered moths existed in two varieties, a light and a dark. And then he goes on to explain the peppered moth story and how somehow because natural selection is true, evolution is also true by equivocation. He's vice president of Mensa. He should have been, had a little bit better logic, I thought. So the way the story goes, before industrialization, he had lichen that grows on the trees. And his lichen was light colored. And so supposedly the moths would rest on this lichen. And there were two types of moths, dark and light. And the dark ones would land on the lichen and birds could pick them off because they could see them. The light ones would land on lichen, and it would, they'd blend in so the birds couldn't see them, supposedly. Well, Industrial Revolution happened, and soot covered the lichen. I think the lichen died. And uh, all of a sudden, the dark-colored moths had an advantage, and so they, they weren't picked off, and the light-colored moths were picked off. Okay, that's the way the story goes. And so you end up with, before, you end up with 99 to 2 ratio of light to dark, and after the Industrial Revolution, you have 98% to 2% of dark to light. Okay, so the ratio has changed. Well, there are some questions that need to be asked. Is this really evolution captured in action? Does it support Darwin's hypothesis of evolution through natural selection? Is this really the most striking evolutionary change ever to have been witnessed by man? I don't think so. There's three important points. As stated before, natural selection is also an important part of the creation fall model, and it was even discussed by the creationist Edward Blythe 25 years before Darwin, not that Darwin gave him credit for natural selection there. Ratios of dark to light moths shifting back and forth in response to their environment is no big deal in the creationist evolution argument anyway. <laughs> this, this is neither here nor there as far as the entire argument. It's still a What's that? It's still a moth. It, yeah, it's still a moth. It's not changed kind, which, as we talked before, is sort of the definition of evolution. You have to have you know, the immutability of the kind changing. You have to have one kind changing into another kind. And number three, natural selection merely filters information by culling it or sorting it. It can never add anything new. Another good example of artificial natural selection, they had these baby harp seals up in the North Pole, and they're so cute. They've got cute little fuzzy coats on them. And they're real good to kill because they can make beautiful, long coats and stuff. There's some people out there who, who didn't like these baby harp seals being killed. Not that there's not plenty of them to go around. So they went out there with some red spray paint and spray painted them red and thought, ah, we saved them. And the polar bears can now spot them from a mile away and ended up <laughs> decimating the baby harp seal population far more than what the people who were trapping them before. Well, that's artificial selection. That is, something changes, they're no longer suitable for, for living in that environment, and they die. Neither is evolution. Baby harp seals were not evolving into whatever just because they were spray painted red. Here we have Harrison Matthews' introduction to Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species. He said this, The peppered moth experiment beautifully demonstrates natural selection or survival of the fittest in action, but they do not show evolution in progress. For however the populations may alter in their content of light, intermediate, or dark forms, all the moths remain from beginning to end, biston bitularia. So changing the ratio is not evolution. They are still the same uh, peppered moths they were before. Okay, to add insult to injury, pepper moths do not rest on tree trunks during the daytime. <laughs> I'll let you think about that. Number two, no correlation found between lichen and light versus dark population increase or decrease. Black and white moths still existed. Those famous photos were faked by painting or gluing dead moths or laboratory moths, so stuporous that they had to be warmed up on tree trunks in the daytime. Uh, University of Massachusetts biologist Theodore Sargent helped glue moths onto trees for a NOVA documentary. He says textbooks and films have featured a lot of fraudulent photographs. And the pepper moth story, which was the prize horse in our stable, has to be thrown out. University of Chicago evolutionary biologist uh, Jerry Coney. And he went on to say in that same article that it was kind of like finding out Santa Claus wasn't real. 
So, poor guy. It's time to grow up. Vestigial organs, the next thing we'll talk about. And they're organs with an unknown use. Loosely translated, we don't have a clue organs. And it, this is something evolutionists do a lot. Remember how they took fragments of bones and they formed an entire missing link from it? Their ignorance does not constitute evidence for evolution. Okay. Just because they don't know what an organ does doesn't mean that it's evidence for evolution. All right. Okay, vestigial organs are used to... School textbooks as recently as the 1960s listed over 200 vestigial structures in the human body, including the thyroid and the pituitary gland. No thanks, I want mine. By evolutionary definition, it is an organ that was once useful during a previous stage of your evolution, but in the course of time, that organ was no longer needed and continued to remain in the body. And by the way, is an organ ceasing to have a function really evolution? I mean, even if it didn't have a function, let's assume that it didn't, and I believe they all do or did have a function. Um, is that really evolution? The, an, organism, an organ losing a function is, is not evolution. You need to have a new organ coming into existence for evolution. Vestigial human organisms. Robert Widersheim, a German disciple of Darwin, wrote a book in 1895 in which he listed 86 vestigial organs. These include valves in the veins, penile glands, thymus, bones in the third, fourth, and fifth toes, certain female organs, and lacrimal tear glands. I want my tear glands. Don't take those. And then one of the most famous ones, and we're really going to talk about the two most famous ones, the whale pelvis, and we're going to talk about the tailbone. The whale pelvis is considered a vestigial organ, and you'll find it in most textbooks. Here it is. Modern whales have hind limbs which have been reduced to only a few tiny internal hind limb bones that have no function. Why is this important? Why are they, why are they choosing this one? Well, because they have to somehow explain how mammals got into, into the ocean. And fish originally grew in the oceans, according to the evolutionists, and somehow they came onto land, and then mammals evolved on land. And so what are mammals doing in the ocean? Well, they must have somehow gone back to the ocean. So if they can find evidence for mammals going back into the ocean, then that helps support evolution. So they've banked a lot on these little bones here. But here we go. Just imagine whales walking around. It's true. Saying it's true doesn't make it true. I'm sorry. Here's the hip bones there. They're just kind of hovering out there. They're not really attached to anything. There they are, hovering there. Whale bones. Virtually all whales have them. Here's a killer whale. Here's a humpback whale. Here's a pilot whale. The whale pelvis is located far from the vertebrae and has no apparent function. Thus, the whale pelvis is a vestigial structure, 2001. It's not very old. The whale pelvis is evidence of its evolution from four-legged land-dwelling animals. Okay, this is a lie, frob, and rip-off. These bones are needed for whales so they can reproduce. There's no more important function when it comes to producing offspring than reproduction. They're an anchor for muscles, and you need them. Okay. The next one we're going to talk about is the coccyx, the tailbone, the human tailbone. And this is another really famous one that you'll hear about as being completely unnecessary. Okay, the coccyx is a small bone at the end of the human vertebrae column. It has no present function and is thought to be the remainder of bones that once occupied the long tail of a tree-living ancestor. Okay, this is a lie. It has several important functions. It anchors muscles of the lower pelvis, which affect bladder, bowel, and reproductive function. And as a matter of fact, if you ranked the bones in your body, if you ranked the importance of them based on how many muscles are anchored to the bones, coccyx would rank number one. It has nine muscles that are attached to it. So it's really important for a lot of things, and I like having bladder control. Number two, it protects a collection of nerves, ganglion empire, that partially control pelvic organs. And number three, meningeal tissue connects to the spinal cord to the inside of the coccyx. So it does have a function. God made us fearfully and wonderfully made, after all. He knit us together in our mother's womb. He had a specific purpose for this thing. It is not the leftovers from a tail, a monkey's tail. Ernst Haeckel came up with the phrase, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. And it's a learned phrase indeed. Ontogeny is the history of the development of an organism from fertilization to hatching or birth. Phylogeny is the imagined evolutionary development of life forms. Now, this is something that's amazingly still in the textbook because it was proven wrong a long time ago. But basically, we're talking about embryonic similarities. They're saying that fish embryos, salamander embryos, turtle, chicken, rabbit, and human embryos all look alike. What astounds me is how weak the case is for evolution. Even if, even if they did look alike, does it mean anything at all? Does this support evolution? I, I don't see how. They seem to think it does. 
Think critically, humans didn't evolve from dinosaurs, yet a human embryo would probably have several features and developmental patterns in common with a dinosaur embryo. Explain why this would be the case. <laughs> if, you're, if you're a child trying to answer that, how would you answer it? I'm not sure what I would do. But here we go. Gills like a fish is what it says. We have gill slits in 1998. We have four brachial arches. They never have anything to do with breathing, by the way. They're not gills at all. BSCS Biological Sciences is the similarity between early stages and the development of many different animals helped convince Darwin that all forms of life shared common ancestors. Okay, so here we have all the different, you know, chickens. We have the human down there, sort of the, the lower one. See how similar they look? Oh, yeah. That somehow proves evolution. Ernst Haeckel was known for perpetuating frauds and half-truths. So this is only one of the examples. There's a handful of them. He forged these drawings. It's interesting. Icons of Evolution, it's written by a guy in the intelligent design movement, but he's got some good things to say. He says, Darwin considered this by far the strongest simple class of facts in favor of his theory. Haeckel called it the biogenetic law. Here we have his drawings, his original drawings. And that's what they actually look like. He was convicted of fraud in 1875 by the Jena University Court. Heckel was forced to issue a modest confession in which he blamed the draughtsman without acknowledging that he himself was that person. So basically they asked him in court, who drew these pictures? Because they're completely wrong. And he said, oh, it's the draughtsman that did it. It's the draftsman. But he didn't tell them that he was the draftsman that, that drew them. So he was convicted of fraud. Heckel's so-called law teaches that all embryos not only look alike, but that they must all develop in the same way, thus proving their ancestry. Okay, there's two basic problems with this idea. The process rates and order of development in the various species vary widely. Fish lay eggs. They don't give live birth, and they don't milk their young. Okay? And just because something looks similar does not necessarily imply common origin. Okay, points to ponder. Yes, I admit, we start out as round. Perhaps we're related to super balls. Okay? If we're just going to look superficially at the surface of things, then we could be related to a lot of stuff. Stop focusing on the outward appearance and learn the real reason certain structures exist. Totally unique. Each animal has a different instruction manual called DNA, which differs greatly from animal to animal. If you really want to look at the differences, you've got to look at the DNA. Evolution by orderly law said this, Moreover, the biogenetic law has become so deeply rooted in biological thought that it cannot be weeded out in spite of its having been demonstrated to be wrong by numerous subsequent scholars. And somehow it's still in the textbooks. A set of 19th century drawings that still appear in reference books are badly misdrawn, says the embryologist in Britain. Although Heckel confessed to drawing from memory and was convicted of fraud at the University of Jena, the drawings persist. That's the real mystery, said Richardson. Here's another picture of his actual drawings. Here it is in 1994, five weeks old, human embryo. 1998, there it is. 2000, there it is, fish, reptile, bird, mammal. Uh, 2001, 2002, 2004, Romans 21 and 23 says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish hearts was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Pepper and Ma's vestigial organs and recapitulation are completely fallacious ideas, and even if they were true, they'd be pretty sorry evidence for evolution anyways. So it's just foolishness. There we have natural selection. Maybe you could balance there, but after next week, you won't be able to. Next up, we're going to talk about DNA, complexity of life, and uh, let me close in prayer, and then we'll open for questions.